Anybody that did not speak last Tuesday, we have a sign-up sheet. All right, we're ready to get started. Uh, if you're signing up, uh, then please go ahead and do so. We'd like for you to uh, hold down the noise a little bit. Before we get started, uh, Representative Curry is going to uh, uh, ask for a blessing. Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you do for us. Now forgive us of our sins and help us to guide us and direct us as we go forward. Help us make the best decisions we can for the people of the state of Georgia. And in all we pray, amen. All right, today we have um, <clears throat> four items on the agenda, two, uh, three voting uh, uh, bills and one uh, hearing. And so uh, the first bill that we're going to hear today is House Bill 196, no, no, I'm sorry, one, let's see, 319, excuse me, Representative Williams. to the estate and so how it reads is um, in the event of death of an active member or a retired member who failed to des designate a beneficiary or if all named beneficiaries have predeceased such member any benefits otherwise payable to under subsections a or b of this code section shall be payable to such members of state all right um Who's number 11? Okay. Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for bringing this bill. But is there room for discussion regarding, you? I think everybody in this room know what business I'm in, and that's the funeral industry. Right, right. So with the funeral homes, and I think we talked about this a little bit last year, but we submit assignments. Correct to insurance companies to ensure that we get paid. Because right. when that's sometimes, unfortunately, when all the benefits go to the beneficiary, sometimes the beneficiary forgets about the mortuary. So is there room for discussion about to ensure that assignments can be accepted from a mortuary to ensure, maybe and maybe this another build, I don't know, but I just want that to come right. to the forefront to make sure that that's uh, is somewhere along the discussion that we can consider that because um, I just want to make sure that beneficiaries are taken care of, but as well as the mortuaries is taken care of. Yes, ma'am, and I would defer to my to the chairman on that um, that question, if it would be a, a new bill or 
if it would come out of a different committee. My understanding that this this is paid above and beyond uh, what would be paid as far as life insurance is concerned. This is just I I don't know is anyone from come on come on up. If you would introduce yourself at the podium and. Hey. Yeah, I'm uh, Morgan Wurst. I'm the executive director of uh, the Firefighters Pension Fund. This is a death benefit, not not a life insurance. It's just from the firefight uh, Firefighters Pension Fund out. Like, just to be clear, it's not a an insurance company. So, um, you know, we are we're trying to clear up a potential uh, a potential situation mm -hmm. that we've had happen on uh, actually for a vested member who uh, had named her mother as, uh, as a beneficiary. Unfortunately, the mother had predeceased her and um, we were uh, with, without, and she was not, if she had been married at the time, we would have given it to the spouse, but absent that, we were not able to pay out. So while we're not ready to address that situation right now, we're not really sure, but we feel we can with this death benefit to, um, you know, we always make somebody name a beneficiary. We wouldn't accept their paperwork without it, but uh, I guess in, in theory that could happen, but uh, this is more in that case where their name beneficiary pre predeceases them. So um, the funeral home issue was not something that we had had considered at when when drafting this to be honest okay do you but do you understand my point that I'm trying to make regarding an assignment when I say an assignment that because um, that when I hear death benefits beneficiaries all of that made me ask that question about could this pension could this um, you know, could you all accept an assignment to ensure that the funeral home get paid from those benefits? Because in some cases, that may be all that that, that person had is what y your um, agency is providing to them. But uh, as apparently this is a, a conversation for another day, but I just want to make sure that um, people are aware that when we are drafting legislation like this, let's consider funeral homes and assignments because we want to make sure that, yes, the beneficiaries get what they are they are, um, you know, what they deserve, but we want to make sure that funeral get paid for as well. And that's where an assignment comes in. And the funeral home submit an assignment to the whoever's providing the death benefit and, and to ensure that funeral get paid for. Um, we'll be glad to entertain a, a, a bill if you, if you want to so do so. Sure. We will certainly give you a hearing on it. All right. All right. <coughs> And we can talk more, but I just want to make sure that's kind of be, be everybody keep that in mind as they're drafting stuff in the future. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Williams or Mr. Worst? Either one. All right. Um, we had no one else signed up to speak on that bill except Mr. Worst. Did you want to add anything to to your testimony other than what you? Uh, Representative Kirby. Uh, then if it's the appropriate time, I'll make a motion. Um, now is the appropriate time. I move to pass. Second. Do I have any other further discussion by the committee? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. Measure passes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Williams, for presenting that bill. Thank you, Chairman. All right. Um, I'm going to turn the chair over to the vice chair. You got an order to run in there? Uh, we'll, this is lax. <coughs> All right, then let's move on to House Bill 196. And Chairman Benton, if you would, tell us about your bill. All right, this bill was brought to me by 
uh, Georgia Municipal Association. Uh, it is a bill that uh, pertains to uh, the retirement and it's, it's, new it's new law and starting on page one at line 14, it defines uh, what a public retirement system is. It also goes on to say that the Georgia Municipal Employees Benefit System or any association of like political subdivisions with contracts with its members for a pooling of assets, that would be the Employee Retirement System of Georgia, the Teachers Retirement System of Georgia, uh, that they are not included in the definition of a public retirement system. And a trustee means a member of the board of trustees or other administrative body or agency charged with the duty of administrating a public retirement system. Well, what the bill does is it sets a minimum amount of education for these trustees, uh, for these retirement systems. And in a lot of cases, these people are not paid, but they have agreed to serve as a trustee uh, to look after the retirement system. And so starting on page 25, uh, each, pub each public retirement system trustee shall complete a, a appropriate education applicable to his or her fiduciary duties and obligations under the public retirement system. Anybody that is first appointed or elected on or after July 1st of this year shall complete a minimum of eight hours of education designated to orient new public retirement system trustees in the areas described. Within one year of becoming a new public retirement system trustee. Now, right now we have nothing that's, we don't have anything that says that they have to do the training, nor what happens if they don't do the training. In other words, this, this next section says that if they fail to complete such requirements within 14 months, they will be removed from their position as a trustee. Now, anybody that's already been on there prior to 2019 who has served one or more years in a public retirement system shall complete a minimum of 12 hours of continuing education every two years in the area described in this code. If they fail to complete such requirement within 26 months, he or she shall be removed from his or her position as a trustee. Now, the reason that, we, that the, the, the bill is being proposed is to make sure that we have people that are looking after these, uh, uh, these trustees are trained in what they're doing. A lot of them are lay people, and maybe they, I don't know, maybe they go along with 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 what maybe one or two people who have had a little training but they all need to have some training if they're not willing to do that then they'll have to step down and the bill goes on to talk about um, uh, ethics and conflicts of interest uh, interest uh, the governance of, of all of this and so I'm asking the committee to uh, give a due pass to uh, requiring that people who are trustees of these retirement system have formal training in their in their area. I'd be glad to answer any questions from the committee. All right, we've got a question number. Who's at number six down there? Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I got a question. Um, so you're required, I guess, once you've been there a year, to have twelve hours every two years. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Right. Do we need to, and I guess that, is that annually, and should we specify like a certain date by December 31st of each year, or is it being expected that once you get it every year, you're going to have to renew, so that means it's, it might be harder to track, I think, if you have everybody on different dates. Well, with them having just to complete 12 hours of education every two years, I, I, I would think that that two years would, 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 would be their renewal date. In other words, they've, they've come on and they've got, now they've been reappointed. Now they've got two years from that point to, yeah. to, to complete that, that training. I'm just thinking as, uh, and I don't know how other certifications are. I know like my CPA license, you have to have two hours every like December 31st of mm -hmm. every two years. So it's just easier for the 
the, the board to track. I didn't know if that mattered or if it if you get appointed December 31st or June 30th you'd, or July 5th, it, you could go two years from that. I, I mean, I it's not a big deal. I just didn't know that mattered. I don't know that it, it matters. Okay. Uh, uh, I would think that uh, whatever would be the easiest to, to keep up with would be. Uh, and if, if you want to put that in a form of friendly amendment, I, I have no objection. Um, if somebody wants to word that friendly amendment, I'd be happy to. <laughs> Do we have anybody? Oh, we don't have anybody here. Yeah, we got. Oh, you got somebody up? We got, got the main man over here. We, yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you would like for it to say that um, two years from the date of appointment or two years well, for the calendar year? I would say the calendar year would probably be easier just to track so that we're not getting into, you know, different dates. And it's easier for oth others, the trustees, probably to follow as well that every even year that you have those, you know, maybe it's even years or maybe it's odd year or whatever you want to do. But every two years that somebody, when they do the renewal, that it's probably easier to keep track of that way versus, and, uh, you know, based on your yeah. appointment date. Yes, I think the first part is fine because you have that 14 months. In section three, yes, so 12 hours, every biennial, or, you know, every even number year or something, you know, I think would maybe that suffice or every. Every two you, calendar year. Either that, or you could say uh, starting with uh, the even year after that. Yeah. Something of that nature. That would mean the first time it, it might be less than 26, and it, next time it would be 20, you know, Correct. it would be two years. So. What about shall complete a minimum of 12 hours of continuing education uh, beginning every two years from his or her appointment? Well, I, so I, that's still putting us back to where that, we That's were. putting it back to what we've got, and, and I think what he was looking for was to get it at the end of the year. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm trying to get it at the end of the year or June. You want to have uh, to be completed before December 31st of the second year of your appointment. And then thereafter, you know, maybe like every two years. <laughs> every two years. Two years there. Yeah. The, the concern I have, we went from a friendly amendment to this could now interfere with the 26 months and change that dynamics. I think we... We're yeah, kind of venturing okay. into a little more detail than just a friendly amendment. And it could be something that we think about over the next few days. Like I said, I don't know how the other boards do it. I just know the ones that I'm familiar with usually. Well, you, you, know. you, might, uh, you might get with GMA and, and see yeah. what they, and they, anything they want to change, they could do it if we can get it out of the House over to the Senate. And that would probably be better. Okay. I'm afraid right. if we go too quickly on this, we're going we're gonna to go in the wrong direction. So I, I agree with the chairman. Okay. Right. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Number nine, it's uh, Representative Tarvin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, this mine does not work really well, as you know. What, uh, who, would, who would this be? Who, who would these retirement systems we're talking about? Uh, would they be uh, cities or? Mr. Worst. Uh, counties or cities or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you said m those those trustees, of course, probably not paid. Those trustees are very fun. I think they're they're, they're pretty sophisticated jobs. Yeah. They get training for theirs. So th these education are readily available, just like they would be for insurance agents, and they're already they're going on somewhere. When you get this is aiming to get the affect folks who are all of a sudden by appointment a, a fiduciary yeah. and may not even know what fiduciary sure. is. 
I'm sure that these entities would pay for that education since these people are not making any money and they're mostly. Yeah, the, the, yeah. the, the firefighters kind of supervise oh. you. The Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Representative Bentley. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm just trying to follow this legislation. I just want to be. I need a better understanding of how this really going to impact. When I hear Georgia Municipal Association, I think about these small cities in my district. It doesn't include them. Okay. Okay. Great. That's what I just want to make sure. Okay. Great. Don't see any more questions. Mr. Worst, you signed up to speak. You you kind of commented from afar. Do you have something else to add? Thank you. So what is the will of the committee today? We got a motion due pass. Do we have a second? Second. second. Have a motion and second due pass. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Motion passes. All right, moving on. Uh, House Bill 298. Uh, Chairman Benton, uh, you can present that bill. What is the term that this is just a little simple bill? <laughs> is it for the children too? <laughs> uh, this is a, a bill that was that was uh, uh, brought to me uh, concerning public employees who commit um, uh, a crime in the capacity of a public or, uh, employee and is commission, uh, they've been convicted of the commission of, of the crime. And right now, upon final conviction, such persons benefit under public retirement or pension system, including any survivor's benefit, if applicable, are reduced by an amount equal to three times the economic impact of the crime. Uh, the payment of the benefits uh, shall cease until such amount has been forfeited after which benefits can be restored. Um, they came to me and asked me to make a change in the, in the bill. It's found on the second page, line 27. You still have the punishment, but as an alternative to the method and manner of session of, or deduction of payments required in paragraph two, a public retirement system may adopt a policy which provides that the regular benefit payments to the person convicted of a public employment related crime shall be reduced in equal installments that are actually determined to be equal to the net present value of the reduction required by paragraph 11. In other words, what they're saying is that they're going to divide it out instead of taking it all out over a period of uh, two or three years. They might take it out over a period of five years, but it's divided out equally where those people that don't have any, in don't have any income because of the payments to repay the crime, they will now have a, some income and paying some. So uh, that's the bill, Mr. Chairman. Uh, pretty, pretty straightforward. Be glad to entertain any questions. Any questions from the committee on this one? All right. Um, don't see any questions up here. We've got uh, Charlotte Davis uh, signed up to speak on this. Uh, if you would, introduce yourself and who you're with. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Charlotte Davis. I represent the Georgia Municipal Association. We have a public retirement system that we operate for municipal employees throughout the state. I just want to thank Chairman Benton in helping us bring this bill. And to clarify, uh, GMA, the Municipal Asso Association, has only requested House Bill 298. The previous bill sounded like a good one, too, though, um, but would appreciate your support on this one. So this bill, as Chairman Benton uh, outlined, does make the administrative change of 
uh, when a payout can be made to the retiree. So it's uh, the the actuarial rec cost of a public crime when a public employee commits one. So that's anything from theft, stealing from City Hall, which typically is easier to determine the value of, but can also be bribery or using your office, um, abuse of power, that type of thing, which can be more difficult to uh, figure out the actuarial cost, three times actuarial cost of that. So the other administrative change that you'll see in the bill um, allows the retirement system a longer period of time to begin the proceedings and actually go to the Office of State Administrative Hearings. So it lengthens that it lengthens the time period from 30 days to 90 days. And that's basically to ensure that everything has been done correctly, that the amount that's being reduced is a fair amount, that more is not being taken out of the pension plan, less is not. Um, and overall will help our pension plan and any other retirement system for that matter. Um, drive down the administrative costs, keeping more money in the pension. So we'd ask for your favorable support of House Bill 298 and thanks, thank the committee members for working on it. Does anybody have any questions for Ms. Davis? Is that a motion to pass? Is there a second? second. A motion and a second. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed nay. Motion passes. So those two are on the rules. All right, Mr. Chairman, you got a, a little bill here. We're hearing only today, House Bill 109. Um, and we're working off of LC431246S. That's correct. correct. All right, please present this bill. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, last week when I presented the bill, this, this bill, I made the statement that I was open to any and all suggestions to try and make this bill better. We are not going to, I'm, I'm not going to push to have it passed until I think it, it's ready. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that sometimes you only get one chance to make, make things right or try to make things better, and I think this is, this is a good opportunity for that. So we did listen to the comments that were made last week. Uh, I wrote them all down and, and met with the uh, Legislative Council about uh, some things that we could do to change uh, the bill to try to accommodate uh, some of the concerns that were, were voiced. And, and, and there were some concerns, that I, the, the emails uh, that, uh, that a lot of the members have gotten and, and a lot of the members of the, the legislature have gotten uh, have, have basically centered on uh, uh, two or three items uh, concerned about teacher recruitment uh, concerned about having to teach beyond a certain age uh, a lot of different things that that go into that and so uh, we have listened to uh, suggestions not only from members of the committee but members uh, uh, e even my own constituents have written me and, and said you know what if you did this or this and so uh, we have come back with a sub, some things that we have done to, to change the bill, to, to make it a better bill. And so starting on page one, uh, at line 22, we have left that, uh, that sentence there intact, uh, that your earnable compensation of, of such individual during the five consecutive years of membership services producing the highest such average we are changing that from two years to five years uh, we're hoping that that will cut down on uh, uh, those instances where pay raises are given just to up the salary to get a better retirement uh, we left on on uh, second page line 39 uh, that earnable compensation shall not exceed two hundred thousand dollars that is down from two hundred eighty thousand uh, that was a uh, law that is law now uh, there was a lot of concern about the amount that would be withheld from an employee's check right now it's either five or six percent the original bill called for six to ten uh, we have come back and changed those numbers uh, to five to nine Uh, yes, 57, 58. Uh, 
Um, we left intact starting on line 116 dealing with sick leave. Uh, we left that in there that you would not be able to accumulate that for uh, to apply toward retirement. And I talked with some student teachers today that were at the uh, PAGE conference and uh, two that mentioned it said that they were not concerned with not having that teacher, that, the sick leave in there. Um, you know, I, I guess it's what you get used to. Um, but uh, again, I want to point out that this does not pertain to anyone that is, that is teaching school right now or is a current retiree. The other big area where we had um, a lot of, some of it was constructive criticism um, about when you would retire. We had a lot of, had a lot of uh, people to complain that it would put them teaching uh, 37 and 38 years. Uh, the average age of a, of a retiree into the retirement system right now is 59 years old. That's the average. That means that you've got a good many people that are past 59 and a lot that are before 59, but 59 is the average. So we decided to change that, and we went with what is called the, the Rule of 85. And the Rule of 85 is simply that if your years of experience and your age equal 85, then you can retire. So at 30 years, if you're 55, you can retire. Or if you're 60 and have 25 years of experience, you can retire. Uh, I've had some questions about uh, people that have gone into a second career with, uh, maybe they were in the military and retired from that and they've gone into teaching where well, you've got a military retirement and once you pass 10 years you are vested in teacher retirement and so however long you, de you decide you want to teach would depend on what your retirement benefits would be. At 20 years of teaching you would be uh, 59 approximately. Um, you can retire at 62 uh, if you have uh, uh, 10 years, in other words, you retire at 10 years. And then in the five consecutive years of membership, service producing the highest such average, we still left that in there about the number of raises that you could receive in there. Uh, that was, uh, I'm sorry, I should have told you the line number. Uh, that's line 199 and 200. There was some talk the other day, and, and I'll have to find it. I don't think I marked it on my copy. Um, that um, Well, I lost my train of thought. Let me go back to this other, and I'll remember the other. That, that's one of the good things about age. Um, <laughs> can't remember what it is now. Oh, yeah, dude. It has to do with if you are a member of teacher retirement and you decide to take your money out and then want to come back and be a member again, if you take your money out after 2019, of the, if after this year, uh, July the 1st, and want to come back in, then you start over as uh, under the new system. Uh, Legislative Council cleared that up for us on that. Um, be glad to take any questions that the committee might have. I think we've got several people that have signed up to speak on this. And so uh, be glad to take any questions. Well, right now you're not showing any questions from up, up Representative Bentley. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. um, help me understand a little bit about what you meant, the number of raises that an educator can receive? Well, Am I saying that correctly? What, we ha what we've had in the past is that under the, the two-year system, we would have people that would receive maybe a big bump in their local supplement or something of that nature to get their retirement on up. Mm -hmm. And so what we're saying here that 
in this five-year period, you can only have a certain number of raises. That that keeps a, lo a local board of education from bumping a, super, a retiring superintendent or a principal or even a teacher uh, local supplement up more than a couple of times during that period of time. So okay. we are trying to make sure that everybody gets what they deserve, but they don't get more than they deserve. Gotcha. So, um, I went. Any other questions? No, thank you. Don't see any other questions right. for you, Mr. Chairman, but we do have a list of speakers. Um, some of you don't write as neat as you think you do. Craig uh, Hasper, is that Hasper? Harper. Harper, that's an R, okay. You need a better grammar teacher teaching how to print. So, If you would, introduce yourself and uh, uh, who you're with. Thank you. My name is Craig Harper, and I'm the executive director for the Professional Association of Georgia Educators, and we're the largest uh, educator association in Georgia with 95,000 members, and as you can imagine, um, retirement system issues are, are very important to our members. Um, we appreciate Chairman Benton and, and this committee allowing us to make a few comments today, and especially appreciate Chairman Benton coming to our, or our organization um, event today, our, our legislative advocacy event, explaining his bill and taking some questions from our group. It was, it was much appreciated. Um, I also appreciate his service as, a, as an educator and as a retiree in the teacher retirement system. Um, we understand this bill is a work in progress and, and uh, know that there have been some adjustments made and, and uh, understand that, that uh, there's a good faith effort and intent um, for, to it, for TRS to continue to be as strong as it can possibly be. Uh, the, the one thing we completely agree with uh, Chairman Benton on is that TRS should maintain its um, status as a defined benefit program. Um, <laughs> That, that really is, is a bottom line issue um, for our members, um, that, that TRS stays strong and is a defined benefit program. Um, some of the issues that, that we feel like are important to address are teacher pipeline issues for recruitment and retention. Um, PAGE has a unique position perhaps in that we kind of support people in all three phases of their career. Um, we have retired members, we have active uh, teachers who are active members of TRS, and we also um, do a lot of work with student teachers um, and colleges of education. So we have members across that spectrum. And we feel like it's important for us to advocate for those to be teachers, those that are in training to be teachers who don't understand the impact of retirement and other benefits that they may have during their career. And they, they wouldn't understand the, um, the impact of, of losing the opportunity for, for uh, sick leave toward retirement and some of those issues. Um, for many years, I was a, uh, an HR director for a local school district and um, new incoming teachers really didn't understand much about their benefits in general, but they especially didn't understand about TRS. And one of, one of the issues we would, we would um, say could still be addressed would be that percentage, that range of percentage, um, and believe that 9% is still a little high. Um, I can tell you even at 6% when we would bring in new teachers and we talked to them about uh, what that impact was going to be on their gross pay. Um, they understood they were going to be making $34,000 as a, a new teacher, but had no idea what 6% off the top meant to them. And often we would be asked, can we waive that? Do I, do I have to be a member of teacher's retirement? And we would explain to them the value of that benefit to them, and they wouldn't want to waive it if they could, and that, that retirement comes a lot faster than you think it does. And 9%, um, the $3,000 raise that we expect, um, is going gonna, is gonna to be on the salary schedule. Nine percent nearly takes every bit of that away from a beginning teacher. And if you have a teacher who comes in with a master's degree, even with zero years experience, comes in with a master's degree, nine percent more than wipes out what that three thousand uh, dollars would be on the salary schedule. So we think that could be a little bit, a little bit high. And there, and there will be a bit of a sticker shock for those incoming teachers. And can't as they, if if that word begins to get out, we think that could have an effect on the teacher pipeline. Um, we think the rule of 85 is definitely an, uh, an improvement over the uh, age 60 retirement requirement. Um, there may be some additional things that could be tweaked there and some more understanding needs to be had on what, what, what that means for second um, career folks who are coming into education. Um, we, still, we know there's a lot to still be done on this bill and we want to be partners with you all and sharing what our members feel about this and our experience and information about this and look forward to following up with you more on this and appreciate the time that we've had to speak with you today. Thank you. All right, you, you have a couple of questions. Uh, okay. Representative Tarvin. Yes, sir, thank you. And uh, I've heard a couple of people 
you said that you represent the teachers in T R S. Is that correct? Well, we represent educators. Um, okay, okay the, educators. And and they are members of T R S. How many how many uh, people are there that represent educators in when it comes to T R S? Is it just your is it just your group or is it? Full no, there are there are a number of educator associations okay. um, that represent. Teachers, I, I can think of probably four off the top of my head. Have you, have you, have you four come to a consensus of what, what you, you would propose to? And I'm not, I'm just no, we, we propose as far as saving the teachers' retirement for teachers in the future. We've not come to consensus on that, okay. and um, we've not polled our members yet on that. That's something. The, that re the reason I ask because when you get all these emails, you get about 50 different ideas, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, the the goal is to, in fact, as uh, I shared last week, how passionate I am about what what difference teachers made in my life. Dramatic, mm -hmm. uh, maybe not in the classroom, but otherwise, I think it's very important that we continue to get people coming into education. But on the other hand, somebody just needs to say, you know, we don't want to put any more in our retirement. We want the state to fun keep funding it from now on. Just Somebody just needs to say what you think instead of this coming. I'm not being smart about right. it. Of course, y'all knew that, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not being intelligent about it. But th we need to quit talking about 69. What, what do y'all propose? Y'all propose just to pay five and the state put another billion in in the next five years? Or that That's kind of the crux of the matter, and I'm not taking the meeting over, but it would help if some of y'all would get together and say, this is what we think we right. could all accept, and then we have to make a decision based on what what is best for the entire state of Georgia, and and I think I thank you, and I thank the teachers. And I, I appreciate that point of view and understand that desire, and we will continue to have conversations with with anybody who'd like to talk with us and with Chairman Benton, and we're continuing to develop what those proposals might be that uh, people would would find access, acceptable, and um, as they have knowledge about that, we certainly understand that there's a fiscal responsibility um, that you all have. Um, and you have to look at that very seriously. Uh, we have uh, done a study of TRS, and from what we were able to gain, uh, understanding is that the TRS is a solid, solid <coughs> retirement system. It's extremely well run. It's well managed. They have, if not the lowest, among the lowest investment costs of any retirement system in the country. Um, they, they are conservative and and how they approach they have not gone into derivatives and all these other kind of things that have gotten other t uh, retirement systems in trouble so it, it, it's a very solid system that we want to see continue to um, serve educators well um, we we tend to look at it a little bit differently although there is uh, the cost to continue to to uh, support trs but it's an investment in those who have committed a life to public service um, so Yes, it is a is a cost from a I guess from a from an accounting standpoint, but we also see it as a as an investment in the people who make the difference for edu for students' lives in Georgia. Representative Wilkinson. Thank you. Uh, I guess to follow up on that, if there is, you know, I I guess we heard a couple things. Is the big issues would be what the five to nine is that probably the one of the biggest ones or that is there a number of, of that would be one of the biggest just the, the percentage going to nine and I know probably there would be no intent for it to immediately go to nine but um, the next time an investment is is required that's significant there's there's going to be pressure to to go up to the maximum just like we've gone to six percent now for many many years and there would even though there may not be intent to go to nine right away I, I can see very um, clearly that that could happen within two to three years if there were pressure to do that so that that's an issue with us, I, I also, um, you'd understand that even though right now there's a two-year kind of uh, uh, calculation on highest on highest salary, it's actually capped. Um, there's a there's a percentage cap, so you don't necessarily get the full benefit of two years. I think five years is a little bit long because of the, I know that the kinds of things that can happen in a five-year period in somebody's career, and those can be very legitimate changes and responsibility duties and responsibilities with with legitimate um, increases in salary that should be recognized um, so there have been abuses um, over the years with people getting suddenly a 12-month contract or a much mm -hmm. higher salary and, and that's not right um, but we shouldn't punish the majority of people who had had nothing um, 
intentional in, in going after a higher salary. It's just the, the changes that they've had in their and their career with administrative responsibilities other things. So I would say the 9% in, in our view is high. I would say that uh, five years is a little bit too long, but mm -hmm. I've not seen exactly how that calculation would work. So maybe, it, maybe it's fine and we just need to have a better understanding of it. And then the rule of 85, I think can, can make a lot of sense and it's easy for people to understand, but I, I worry still a little bit that it may um, have people working longer than they would necessarily with a 30 30 year career or 35 year career there are even though they're the average may be 59 there are a whole lot of people that do retire at 30 years and they're 51 52 years old but there are also people i know many of them who chose to to work until they had 40 years of service um, they weren't there to to retire they were there to make a difference in kids lives and they stay in it just as long as they they can okay um, and so what may be helpful i, I apologize is is with that five to nine or five to six right now is if as we go through the discussion if there could be some type of agreement one on is there a need to increase it because um that is the kind of comment that comes out is that we're going to take more of it away and if if there's an agreement that needs to be increased then what does that increase look like that's palatable to all those involved because i i get what we're saying that as a state we're saying we want to invest more in teachers by giving this $3,000 increase, but if we're just gonna take it away and put it in another bucket, we're really not giving that increase. So one, I guess, agree that it needs to be done if, if it does need to be done, and then two, what that type of rate looks like, and then that would be helpful for us, I think, going forward as we continue this process. So. And I, and yeah, I, th I think that's a discussion we definitely need to have. So the other thing, this is not a state health kind of discussion, but the same kinds of things happen with state health premiums uh, when uh, when some increases may happen and then state health premiums go up. So if you've got state health premiums go up, you've got teacher retirement rate may go up. So there's a lot of things impact overall compensation. So um, we, look, we look forward to having those conversations with you all and, and trying to figure out what that may look like. All right. Um, by the way, real quick, that's TRS, that's the employee contributions pre-tax contribution? Uh, it's on the gross, gross pay, yes. Yeah, it's pre-tax, okay. Mm -hmm. Representative Rich. Here, Thank here. you. Yeah, there I am. <laughs> you had said earlier in your testimony, and I've received a lot of emails from teachers, um, that the TRS is a significant recruitment tool. Um, and then you had some stories, I guess anecdotally, about teachers who actually did not want to participate because they didn't want to have to contribute. Have you all conducted any studies or polls to support your position that it is a significant recruiting tool, or is that just something that you have surmised because you've heard anecdotal evidence we of that? We have surveyed on that question, and if you would allow me, Josh Stevens is our legislative analyst, and he runs our polls, and he would be much better able to answer specifically that question if he would. Okay. But we, ha we have polled our members on how much of a a draw it is to stay in the profession. Okay, and I am I am new to learning the TRS, so when the teachers contribute their 6% right now, if they leave before retirement, are they able to wi take with them what they have contributed? What they contributed plus interest. Yes, if. And if it was tax-free, so they can move it to another tax vehicle. Yes, so it's just, we're making them save for their retirement. Mm -hmm. Yes. And if, if they're not vested, well, even if you are vested, if you chose to take your money out, which would not be very smart at all, but if you, you can take it with you, plus the state pays in more interest, which is another issue that we've had um, raised, that the rate of interest on those withdrawals is higher than you could get right now with any kind of um, investment. But you can, you can move it to another tax-protected vehicle, however. Uh, you you could, but it but it would it would come to you as income. It would not be like a like an IRA or or a four hundred one three b or four hundred one k that you could roll o do a direct mm -hmm. rollover and not have any tax implications. Okay. I believe you would have to take this as either okay. capital gains as, or some kind of income. Okay. Thank you. Representative Bentley. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just have a comment then a question. Um, I want to make sure that somehow I'm glad to see Paige and GAE are represented here this afternoon, um, but I would love to stay in contact with Paige and GAE when we're out of session. Um, okay. Most of the time, the only time that I'm connected with you all is doing session. So when we're out of session, I don't hear from Paige or GAE. I do get the newspaper, the, the magazines in the mail, so I like that. But 
I like that interaction um, before session starts. And so I don't ever hear from you all. So I would love to, to make that happen. But my question is, um, I've heard talk about, because I too have received a lot of emails, so I've, and I've heard comments about um, Georgia has a teacher shortage now. So I'm curious to know, what is it that Paige and GAE can answer when they come up? What are you all doing now to address that particular issue of a teacher shortage in the state of Georgia? I'll give you a very short answer. We'll be glad to follow up with you more because we've got a lot going on in the teacher pipeline and development area. And so we have a program called Future Georgia Educators where we have uh, sponsored clubs and high schools all over the state of Georgia. We, this year, I believe, have 10 uh, conferences that we do on college and university campuses where students come from all over the region in that area and participate in some competition and also learn about what it's going to be like to be a, uh, an education student and what to look forward to and what to expect. Uh, we also are highly supportive of the teaching as a profession pathway uh, through um, coursework with the Department of Education that high schools can offer. We do not have enough TAP programs active in our high schools. Um, even though it's in kind of a CTA, CTAE area, it does not receive funding weight like the early childhood um, care uh, pathway. So we think that should be changed, but we are we're doing everything we can to support colleges, universities, and high school students um, to pursue a career in education and then providing them support to get there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Josh, Thank you. Do, do you know, we, we were kind of discussing, is, is there a trustee to trustee transfer available or not? Or can you find that out when you send that other information? Does anybody know? Representative Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this is, I don't know if it, how, how are we going to uh, resolve this. And the Chairman Benton, in one of my counties, there are the teachers that are being paid. They're not being paid on the uh, standard salary schedule. They move, the uh, Board of Education moved to have a waiver. And so for the last couple of years, they have not res uh, received the pay raises. They are faced, uh, here we are talking about a $3,000 uh, increase. They will not be paid on that standard. And if we talk about fair and taking care of those teachers that need to be taken care of, you know, if you have one in one county that's different from this county, how is that fair to those teachers who have uh, who are preparing to retire, and they're going to be um, penalized? We could also have a really long conversation about that. <laughs> we w we would agree with you on the point that um, waivers and charters have really made it difficult for compensation and lots of um, the waivers uh, really have because I'm not right. I'm not sure they are actually looking at those waivers. They are just I don't know how many they turn down at the department. This is this is a serious thing for these uh, counties, small counties, and the teachers that are dedicated to go in and do this time and time again. The largest cities and counties they do not have this problem. Right, they already pay over the minimum salary schedule. We we would love to see that you're required to at least pay the minimum on the state salary schedule, and the and the flexibility is in how you do anything different than that. But it's the, something's got to be done that. Uh, you know, this, that's not fair, and I'm asking this committee and Chairman Benton to really look at this to see how we can, we can solve this for those individuals there. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Um, in the interest of time, we've got a couple more people from Paige, uh, Paul and... Uh, uh, Jason Pratt have signed up. Do you have anything different or additional information? Yeah, all right. You would introduce yourself and tell us who you're with. Mr. Chairman, committee members, thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Harworth. I'm an educator. I'm a classroom teacher. Um, I teach career tech. I'm a military veteran, and I teach uh, junior ROTC. I'm also the department head for career tech at my high school. Uh, we have about 13 teachers. I know that's small, but uh, most of those are not, they are career, second career teachers, but they're not military veterans. 
they, they come from other careers without a uh, previous retirement too. So the concern uh, beyond what Mr. Harper has said is the concern about uh, the requirement of number of years to be vested in teaching. If that were to shift too much, too drastically, that would be a concern. Um, Career Tech um, reported from uh, the Georgia Doe that the uh, pathway completers in high school, if they complete pathways, the graduation rates around 96% in the state of Georgia, which is considerably higher than around the 80% that people graduate from high school in Georgia. So we see that there's a, uh, an importance and perhaps a growing need for more career tech courses and, and programs in the state of Georgia. And if we affect too much as far as putting the bar too far out as far as the number of years to require teachers to teach in career tech, um, that could significantly impact the recruitment and retention of teachers to that field. That kind of thing. So, but Mr. Harper covered pretty much the rest of it. So. You don't seem to have any questions, so thank you. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so Jason Pratt doesn't have anything to add new, it's all the same? Okay. Can you introduce yourself and who you're with? Hi there, Mr. Chairman and committee. Uh, my name is Jason Pratt. I'm from Clark County. I'm an eighth grade math teacher. Um, I just wanted to quickly share my experience and how this issue uh, can affect me in my classroom. Um, for my kiddos, uh, retention and recruitment are something that affects me and in my class in particular. Uh, my county lost 16% of our teachers last year um, and uh, counties across the state are facing the teacher shortage that uh, y'all had just talked about. Um, when teachers aren't in the classroom, when we have uh, our chorus teacher quit, uh, their replacement quit, their long-term sub quit. When we have uh, our Spanish teacher leave to go become a uh, worker at the restaurant on the border because they can make more money. Um, our sixth grade math teacher to go take a tech job somewhere else. Um, those students in those classes uh, get split to my class. And so then I'm having to teach uh, my students as well as uh, students from other classrooms and to find a way for students sometimes even in other grades uh, to to be taught um, and so at a time where this is happening uh, teacher recruitment and retention is incredibly important so I hope you'll consider my experience when you're uh, making these decisions and wondering if if this is a time to consider a reduction in the uh, the the benefits um, and then just two quick suggestions uh, that, that could make it an easier pill to swallow uh, one, I think younger people move around a lot more often. So if there's some type of um, making transferability or reciprocity with other states um, increase, that might make it easier for uh, new teachers to accept. Uh, and then I'd also like to suggest that um, teachers who are uh, already in a teacher ed program um, maybe be grandfathered in as well as they haven't had uh, this information if a change were to be made when they made their uh, decision to pursue a degree in higher in or in education uh, Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jason. You don't seem to have any questions All right, who else we got we've got um, Antoinette Smith Antoinette if you would yeah. introduce yourself who you're with and who you represent Good afternoon, I'm Tony Smith. I'm the president of Georgia Association of Educators Retired. And I'm speaking to you today also as a resident of Newton County, Georgia. Uh, you've heard about the concerns about recruitment and retention. Uh, if this bill in its current form were to pass and become law, um, I'm also very concerned about lowering the cap from $280,000 to $200,000. I think this uh, is a disincentive for teachers to pursue uh, higher education, to pursue advanced degrees in their subject areas uh, by lowering the cap by $80,000. We want to encourage teachers who are in the field 
uh, to pursue advanced degrees in the subject area because it enhances their ability to teach these subjects and makes them more effective educators. And so uh, I'm very concerned about that lowering of that cap uh, to $200,000. Mm -hmm. And I agree with everything that the executive director of PAGE has said. Yeah. All right, I don't see any questions for you, so thank, thank you. you. Uh, we've got John Palmer. If you want to introduce yourself. And Good afternoon. My name is John Palmer, and I'm with the group uh, Tragic, the Teachers Rally to Advocate for Georgia Insurance Choices. We began about five years ago with changes to the state health benefit plan, and we are one of the few groups that actually combines teachers and state employees. Um, I first want to start off by saying we really appreciate uh, Representative Benton's efforts here to preserve TRS and especially his willingness to listen to concerns. I know I sent him an email last week. He responded. Many of those things were in his sub. We appreciate that. Um, we appreciate everyone's understanding that the experiment with the employee retirement system that happened a few years ago is not one that we want to go down the road with, with TRS. Um, we have many members uh, of our group that are both state, that are state employees, and I haven't found one that would prefer the employee retirement system, the teacher retirement system. Um, so we do thank for these efforts uh, to help preserve TRS because we do believe that, that TRS is very important for the retention of, of educators here in the state. I do want to ask, though, if we have been looking at TRS in the wrong way. We talk about unfunded liabilities. That number gets thrown around a lot. But not every single teacher in our state is going to retire tomorrow, and we are going to not have teachers to fill the gaps after that. So if we're looking at that liability, it's not like we're going to have to suddenly replace everyone right away. And TRS has an economic impact of billions in Georgia's economy, uh, especially in rural counties where the school district is the, larger employee, is the largest employer in those counties. Uh, many of those retirees stick around. Uh, it puts millions of dollars into those, those rural economies. Instead, we want to look at why we might be having recent issues with TRS, because during the recession, the state didn't have to put much money into the fund at all. It's only in the last couple of years. And I think it's probably a result of 16,000 fewer teachers right now in Georgia than we had before the recession. Um, that's fewer teachers putting money into the system. We also have 150,000 more students in Georgia's classrooms right now than we had 10 years ago. It seems to me like one solution that might work is to hire more teachers in lower class sizes. We'd have more teachers than putting money into TRS. We wouldn't have as much of that liability. Um, in the interest of looking at this legislation, my, my biggest concern here is, you know, how long will, we see, will it take until we see some benefits from this legislation? Will we change things and have to wait years down the road to see those benefits because we're talking about teachers who were just now entering the pipeline in 2019 and the folks who are saying that TRS has a problem will still be saying that in a year or two because they're going to be looking at these other numbers. Um, so I do ask that if we do make a change to TRS that, that we make sure that folks know that this is something that's going to take a while to see if, if any benefit comes to us. But um, we do appreciate the, uh, the attempts to really hold to the defined uh, benefit because we feel that that is a very important part of TRS. Thank you. All right. You don't seem to have any questions. That's everybody that signed up. Um, um, in the interest, since there's here, anybody else would like to speak you, besides somebody re speaking? <laughs> well, I just want to provide one clarification um, for somebody to share with me. You can do a direct rollover. I was forgetting about the partial lump sum option CSA. You can do some direct rollovers into another tax deferral or tax protection. Okay. All right. Mr. Chairman, you have the last word on your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, y'all listening today. I appreciate people coming today. Uh, we continue to listen. Uh, I want to point out that some of the things that were mentioned today are not things that are addressed in this bill. Uh, I understand about the teacher shortage. Uh, we had a lot of people that left the profession during the recession and didn't come back. Uh, we also have uh, uh, changes in policy that have allowed uh, school systems to uh, become more in control of their dollars. And as long as uh, the results, as far as test scores are concerned, they're allowed to do 
certain things with the number of employees and the number of students in classrooms. And so that that has affected the, the teacher retirement for the fact that there are fewer teachers. But uh, the, the, the point that was made a while ago about the teacher quitting and then her sub quit and her, and her, a lot of that has to do with the situation that you're placed in. Uh, some people are not prepared for um, going into a classroom. Uh, we tried that experiment several years ago by allowing uh, individuals who had not been through teacher training to go into the classroom and try to teach school. And uh, we found out that most of them didn't stay more than six months, uh, especially in the, the lower grades uh, up, up to high school or maybe uh, they did succeed in the STEM, STEM classes and that type of thing. We will continue to listen. We uh, will probably be back next week with a, with a different version. Uh, I, like I said, I listened to what everybody had to say today. Uh, some ideas are good, uh, and that's what we need. Uh, but uh, uh, again, we uh, appreciate everybody uh, making a contribution to, to this. So I, I'm, I'm finished, Mr. Chairman. You can dismiss. All right, well, don't have any more business, so this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.